Proverbs. So we're going to go to Proverbs 18 and 22. But put a pen in that one. God says, it is not good that man should be alone. Then it says, I'm going to make him a helper. Proverbs 18 and 22. Amen. Proverbs 18 and 22. Somebody read that one for me. He who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. He who finds a wife findeth a good thing and obtaineth favor of the Lord. All right, God said it is not good for man to be alone. It says, I have made him a helpmate. Then it says, he who finds a wife findeth a good thing. And then more importantly, it says, obtained favor from the Lord. All right, and here, here, here the bunk. Here the bunk. Without a wife, a man is incomplete. Without a wife, a man is incomplete. Here's the interesting thing about a wife. Uh, when I met my wife, I already had money. I had a college degree already. I had somewhere to live. I didn't have a house. I had somewhere to live. I thought I was cool. But what I didn't realize was all my furniture was raggedy. All the towels was smelly. The bathtub, we never washed our bathtub. It was like a science project in there. You walk in there and it was just, it, was, it wasn't even black. It was just green. It just, the whole tub was green. The towels had mold on them. But we was fellas. So for us, we was cool because we, we called it Pit Palace. It was three three bachelors. We was good. My wife walked in there and she, oh my God, what the hell? That, oh Lord, she, and everything. I mean, we had uh, the couch. It had food just in it, just on the couch. Just food in the couch, underneath the couch, behind the couch, my bed. Oh, we don't want to talk about that. Praise the Lord. Put it this way, I had never ever washed my bed sheets. Don't tell nobody. I had lived, in, I'm telling you what it is. I'm gonna tell you what it is. It was Pin Palace, baby. And back then, I was doing some wrong things on that bed and never washed the sheet, never washed anything. Praise the Lord. If you could have just got them sheets off, you could have read the whole, it was just the whole biography is on every sheet. Oh, Lord. Oh, uh, 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 amen. So here's the thing. When I got married, when I got a wife, she came in there and she said, baby, we get rid of all this furniture. And she got to say, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then she said, we're going to get this carpet done. And then she said, we're we, we going we to wash the towel. You got to wash, baby. You got to wash. We're going to clean the towel. When you get a woman, she put things in order. Most men don't have that. I don't know too many brothers it's a few, but I don't want to be brother saying, ooh, my curtain should be this color. <laughs> oh my God, hey, man. I don't know too many dudes who get that. Now some do, but I don't know too many. Most brothers that just roll, you know. Go ahead, brother. I noticed women are way more organized. Man, they're more organized. <laughs> my wife cleans out the refrigerator at least once a week and throw away most of my food, pray the Lord. But my wife, she cleans out everything. She, she just organizes stuff. Women just have that gift. That's just how God made them. And the interesting thing is, a man could be cool without a woman, but he's not complete. Because that woman's gonna add something to you that we don't have. As fellas, we cool. I have a friend right now, and he might be watching, so I can't say his name. Um, he's a lawyer. Matter of fact, he's a judge. He's not only a lawyer, he's a judge. And let me tell you this story. He's a judge. And I ain't gonna tell the whole story. Bishop, like, don't say everything. He's a judge and he's a lawyer. But if if, if you seen it, you would say you need some help, baby, because everything ain't together all right. Everything ain't all right together. If he had a woman, see, a woman ain't gonna let you walk out of the house looking. Man, go in there, go change your clothes. Sometimes my wife looks at me like, nah, you can't wear that. And I think I'm sharp, baby. I'm sharp, baby. I'm sharp. Said, no, no, go change your clothes. <laughs> See, we, you need somebody to say, baby, you got some, go wash your face. Go put some lotion on. She tell me that all the time. He, he said, nah, you ain't telling me that. You, you need that because as men, that might not be what we have. Because, see, that's why God said you need a helper. Here's the thing about men. You want God to give you favor. Favor. There's a famous scene, it was Fred Hammond. Fred Hammond got divorced. 
And I was at Faithful Central Church, and he said this on, on the stage. It was 15,000 people there. He says, I got divorced. And everybody's like, oh, my God. He says, the only thing I miss about the divorce is the favor of God. He says, since I've been, been divorced, I have not had God's favor. What does God's favor mean? As I was driving here tonight, there was a police officer. I got behind, praise the Lord. God's favor means the police just said, look away. And they look away. God's favor. Today, I went to a, a church meeting. And they said that they were going to give me credit for thousands of dollars for this church to help it grow. So we're going to be able to do some decorations. We got a camping trip that's going to be paid for. And y'all ain't got to pay a penny. $4,000 for y'all. Hallelujah. going camping. All y'all going for free. Praise the Lord. And when you ain't, you ain't got to pay, all you got to do is show up with your little sleeping bag. Praise the Lord. That's, that's it. You know, go get your hair. Get your hair right. All right. That's all you got to do. God will give you favor. Favor. You can't buy favor. So that's the benefit of being married. Because see, Dr. King wouldn't have been Dr. King without Coretta Scott. You need that woman to give you that extra push. Steve Jobs wouldn't have been Steve Jobs without Mrs. Jobs in the background doing the push. So the thing is, you need that woman to give you that extra. Come on, go on out there, baby. Go on out there, baby. Go on out there, baby. Amen. All right, next. Turn with me to Proverbs 15 and 1. Proverbs 15 and 1. We already booked the Proverbs. Proverbs 15 and 1. Amen. <coughs> My wife, well, first of all, let's read. Somebody read it for me. Proverbs 15 and 1. A soft answer, a soft answer turns away the wrath, but a harsh word stirs up wrath. A soft word turns away wrath, but a grievous word stir up anger. <laughs> a soft answer turns away wrath. How many of you have ever done something stupid while you were mad? Raise your hand. I busted my baby mama's back window out. I had a break. Man, you ain't gonna say that to me. Bow! And after I did, I was like, you stupid fool. Dude. And I had to go buy this woman a new window. <laughs> See, the thing is, you do. Hey, yeah, and child support came shortly thereafter. But the point is, when you're angry, you, you, there, you cannot rationalize when somebody is mad. What that means is, if somebody is already mad, it's, it's already, you can't talk to them and say, come down, come down. It's already too late. They gone already. But if you make it worse, when you start popping off, yeah, what you going to do about it, homeboy? Yeah, what's up, nigga? What's up? When, when, when you start tripping, or if you a woman, that's why your mama says, there you go. The man already mad, and then you're going to talk about his mama. See that? The, you you got to, there's, there's sometimes you got to do this ministry. Shut up. Sometimes you got to be quiet. Sometimes you got to walk away. But what we do, some of us do, we pop off. And they already mad. If you can't pop off if they already mad. Because now all you want to do is make them more angry. And when people get angry, some people lose control. I have a friend, when she get mad, she black out. <laughs> Literally, when she get mad, she black out. And she don't know what happens after that point. She just, and she, and the next day, girl, you did, what, what happened? She don't even, run. she gets so upset, she blacks out, and she forgets everything, and she don't, she's not responsible for what happens after that. Now, here's the travesty of this. Here's the travesty of this, and this is why I'm talking about this. I, my, my wife got me watching these uh, these killing shows, Atlanta Housewives, all this craziness. Reality, that's what y'all call reality TV. All these killing shows. Well, I was watching one, and I, I'm ashamed to say it, but I've been married 23 years. I, I, Sometimes I watch this BS. I'm watching one, Fatal Attraction, that's what it's called. I'm watching one, and this man killed his girlfriend. There's always the story. And then a statistic came out. Now, this here's the crazy part. This is why we're talking about this. It says in the United States, right now, there are one million women who've been shot by their lover within the past couple of years. One million. 
one, I didn't say 10,000, it didn't say 100. It said one, there, there are 350 million Americans. So if you do one out of 350, that means you got an 8.6% chance of getting shot by your man in an argument. And the reason why a lot of this happened, first of all, the men, if you know your man is a fool already, shut up. Because you know, first of all, he's bigger than you. He's stronger than you. And now you're gonna talk, and, and now you gonna say, say, and women know how to hit you low. Boy, you don't know what you're doing in bed. <laughs> yeah. My last, my last boyfriend had more money than you. <laughs> my last boyfriend can hit it right. Oh, there it is. All right, all right, all right. You, you done said the wrong thing. The man already mad. Shut up. Be quiet. Walk away. Y'all just keep talking. Now, here's the other thing. I, I don't want none of y'all raise your hand. I don't own a gun. Because I know I'm a fool already. A lot of people buy guns to protect themselves. And they end up causing harm to people that they love. I don't know one person who's ever defended themselves with a gun. I grew up in the hood. I'm from you know, 6th Avenue and 30th Street. I grew up in the neighborhood. And I know guys that walk around, they guns, you know, all over the place. And all over, they got it in the pants and the back and all this. And here's the thing. If, if you got a gun, the only way it's going to help you is if the person misses. That's it. A gun is not a defensive weapon. It is offense only. It can't stop nothing. I mean, you can front pull it up. Yeah, I got one. Get away from me. I'm dangerous. <laughs> I mean, that might work. And if they shoot. But, but if somebody is coming for you and they already got theirs out, it's too late for you to go, hold on. Let's go. Hold on, man. Give me a minute. Let me find. Okay, you ready? That ain't how it happens. <laughs> so people buy guns for protection. But often, it ends up causing more pain than it does protection. So this is something for you to think about going forward. As adults, young adults, you guys want to have a house. And you might have a, yeah, we need a gun so we can protect ourselves. Nah, baby, I don't want no guns in my house. What do you mean? We need a gun to protect ourselves. What if somebody break in? Call the police. <laughs> Buy you a, what? I got this. I'm gonna bust a cap in them. Nah, bro. Stay <laughs> how it goes. <laughs> so this is something to consider. Uh, ladies, if you argue with your man and it starts to go left, leave it alone. I ain't no punk. You can't fight him and win. So be quiet. If he hit me, I'll call it. But you can't call if you dead. Walk away. Because one million women within the last few years have gotten shot. We ain't talking about the ones beat up, dragged down the street, and all the rest of that. We just talking about shot. By they man. Yes, sir, Bishop. But also, we should control ourselves. All right, Bishop. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah let's get that. Barack Obama. Barack Obama. <laughs> now, he is right. You should try to control yourself. Control. I'm peaceful. I'm in control. But the reality is, some people say the wrong things to you and they hit and they hit those insecure spots. See, you can say something to some people and get away with it. But if you start telling them the truth about themselves, all of a sudden, they mad. And the more you talk, the madder they get. And when the man stops talking, that means you might better start walking. So if he just starts looking at you, it's time to roll, doc. It's time to roll. All right, next thing, next thing. <laughs> Turn to 2 Samuel 7 and 20. My job is to save lives. Amen. That, that's my job. It's to get y'all into heaven and to save lives while you're here on earth. So, you know, you can bring your husband in and say, Pastor Ace, he got an anger problem. Me and he can sit down and we can talk and find out his dad didn't love him and we can go through all that. But you ain't got time for that in the heat of an argument. Amen. Turn to 2 Samuel 7 and 20. 
Give me a more than anything. Second Samuel seven and twenty. Amen. Amen. Second Samuel seven and twenty. That's a good one. It just is very short. Somebody read that for me. And what would David say more to you? For thou art God, no concern. And what can David say more unto thee? For thou, Lord God, knowest thy servant. It says, and what can David say more unto thee? For thou, Lord God, knowest thy servant. Does God know you? Hmm? Does God know you? All right, let's see why this is important. Turn with me to Matthew 7 and 21. So the question here is, does God know you? And you're going to see why this is important. Matthew 7 and 21. Matthew chapter 7 and 21. So the question right now is, does God know you? David, God knew David. And the interesting thing about David, David was a big time sinner. He had his friend killed so he could sleep with his wife. David was scared. Oh yeah, David was scared. But the Bible says that David was one of God's most favorite people. David died with two 20 year olds in his arms. David hit anything that was walking down the street. He loved women. But he still was God's favorite man. And the reason why he was God's favorite man because God knew him. So my question to you is, does God know you? Matthew 7 and 21. Somebody start reading. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the ones who do the will of my Father who is in heaven. Good. Start right there. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of God, which is my Father in heaven. Then it says, Many shall say unto me that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? That's talked about the preachers. And then it says, Have we not cast out devils? And in thy name we done wondrous works. Verse 23, here's the killer. He says, And then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, thy workers of iniquity. He, got, he says here, I never knew you. How does God get to know you? You said what? Praying, okay, that's one. Have a relationship. Have a relationship. Fasting. Fasting. Tithing. Reading and reading your Bible. So let's get the easy way. Coming to church, God's going to get to know you. Because first of all, I'm up here hollering at you. So a little bit of that's going to permeate some of your neocortex. Then number two, read your Bible. Number three, tithing. That's operating in faith. If you do those three basic things, you now establish a relationship with God. Because the more you do those things, the closer that you get with God. And eventually, he's going to start talking to you if you do those things. The problem with these men, they didn't do none of those things. They just says, God know my heart. I love that one. I know people that use that one. <laughs> Won't you go to church? God know my heart. I ain't got to go to church. You don't take all that. Why don't you pay no time? They ain't giving nobody my money. What are you talking about, man? Get up out of here. Everybody in this room knows somebody like that. What you going to church for? You scared? I got this. And the Bible says, you don't want God to say, I don't know you. You want to be in a relationship with him. Does that mean you're going to be perfect? No, 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 no. You're young. You're in L.A. You're doing your thing. Ah, it's life. <laughs> But the point is, if you have that relationship with God, he's going to tell you, be like, Grayson, you shouldn't have sex without a condom. Then he's going to say, Zion, you shouldn't be on your Instagram saying certain things. Then he's going to say, you shouldn't get so many tattoos. God going to start speaking to you because you got a relationship with him. And the more you talk to him, the more he's going to relate to you and he's going to speak to you because you're in a relationship. It doesn't mean you're perfect. The Bible said, he, God said we should strive for perfection, but I don't know nobody that's perfect walking around here. So the point is, God wants a relationship with you. And the last thing, turn it with me to 1 John 3.18. 1 John 3.18. That's way in the back. Go to Revelation, page 11. 
Give me, give myself away. First John three eighteen. This is a good one. First John three eighteen. First John three eighteen. Way in the back. Amen. All right, somebody read it for me. My little children, let us not love in the words, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. What that means is this. Actions speak louder than words. Weak ass words. Whatever that means. <laughs> Actions, you can't help it out tattoo. Actions speak louder than words. God is not going to judge you for what you say. God is going to judge you for what you do. And some of us say and do opposite things. We say I'm a student, yet you never study. You say I'm a Christian, but you don't go to church. You say you're a parent, but you don't spend no time with your kids. You say all these different things. I, I have a, and I'm, I'm mad at my frat brother, I'm going to tell the truth. I, I have a whole bunch of frat brothers, and they say, yeah, we're going to help the people, we're going to help the youth. And I'm like, dude, I got a whole church full of young men that need some mentoring. Only one or two showed up. And you say, I'm about that life. I'm about the community. I'm about my people. Yet you live way far away and you never come back to help nobody. We say and do opposite things. And God says, stop talking about what you're going to do and do it. I commend these two young ladies who said, we're going to go out and go feed the homeless. Now here's, here's the crazy thing about feeding the homeless. It ain't easy. A lot of homeless people are crazy in hell. <laughs> That, that someone won't money, someone won't cuss you out. I don't eat sandwiches. <laughs> what? Time out, time out. Do you have money? Can you give me a beer? Look, I'm trying to give it. They won't say crazy things. So they're going to see, but that's not on them. Because they stepped out and said, we're going to help people who want to be helped. So don't be, don't talk about what you're going to do. Be about it. You have to be about certain things. Be a man or a woman of your word. If you say you're going to do something, do it. Don't be somebody that say I'm going to do something and you don't do it. I remember, I, this is the biggest whipping I ever got in my life. I was seven years old, six years old. And my uncle told me that we was going to the water park. Now, I lived in Arkansas. Y'all don't know, you in California, everything is fabulous. Arkansas is dry and just boring, period. So and he said, we going to the water park. And I said, yay! So I got up and got dressed at 6.30 a.m. I was sitting on the porch at 7 a.m. Because we're going to the water park. Now I am 50 years old today, I was six. I waited on that porch till 4.30. From 7 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. About 4.45, he come up rolling up. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Yeah, well, I think the water park closes. And I said, I ain't never cursed at a grown up my man. I said, you is a damn liar. <laughs> now, I'm six years old. This is a grown man. But I had the fear. I had no fear that day. I said, you then, oh, boy, I put some words on it. Now, I'm a six-year-old, a little six-year-old with a funny shape. I said, you that damn liar. Because he told me something, and he did the opposite. He disappointed a child. That's why we go to the movies every weekend. Because I was disappointed as a child. I don't want children to be disappointed. Because that follows you for the rest of your life. I never forgot. I'm 50 years old, and I still remember that. It was 44 years ago. The thing is, be a man or a woman of your word. Don't say, don't say you one thing and do another. Because if you do, you ain't fooling nobody. First of all, you can't fool God. Because he knows what you're going to do anyway. But you often fool people. And some people are trusting in what you say. They, they're trusting and believing in what you say. It's like if somebody that's called daddy. And you never see him. That breaks a young man's heart. And these young men grow up and they're, now they're angry. And now you married to this angry man 
And you don't know why he's going upside your head. Because a father said something to him and disappointed him. Most black men that I know are broken. Most Mexican men that I know are broken. That means something in their heart ain't right. And if you hit them the wrong way or push them the wrong way, they going off on you. That's why one million women have been shot. Because they pushed or said or did something and that boy snapped and went bazook. So the point is, don't get in the habit of saying things that you're not going to commit to. Be a man or a woman of your word. Be a man or woman. And the last thing. Turn to Matthew 22. It's the last thing. Matthew 22. And for those of you Bible scholars, you can find the same thing in Joshua 2.12. But Matthew 22 and 37. This is good. Matthew 22 and 37. Matthew 22 and 37. This is powerful. Matthew 22 and 37. Amen. I'm going to read it to Equinite Time. Jesus said unto them, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. All right, keep God first. Keep him first. Lead in your life. Verse 38. This is the first and great commandment. That's the greatest commandment. And the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Verse 40. On these two commandments hang all the, all the laws of the prophets. <clears throat> when I was growing up as a kid, they said, treat your neighbor how you want to be treated. Treat your neighbor how you want to be treated. But what we do is, we treat people how we feel like treating them. We don't treat a lot of people how we want to be treated. We look at a person, and whether we like them or not, that's how we treat them. We treat them based on our emotions. The Bible didn't say nothing about whether you like somebody or not. It says treat people how you want to be treated. When I was driving and the police officer got behind me, my kids know that if I drive in the car with me, if you let me over, I'm going to roll my window down. I don't care if it's raining outside, it's cold, I'm going to roll my window down. And I'm going to go, thank you, praise the Lord. I'm going to right wave at you. I'm going to say thank you. You'd be surprised how a little thank you can go in somebody's life. Treat people how you want to be treated. If you want people to be rude to you, then treat people rude. But what we do is we treat people based on how we feel. And here's the thing about feelings. They change. Feelings are inconsistent. Up and down. Hey, I like you. You're my friend. Cure. I mean, you go all over the place with feelings. <clears throat> Often tease uh, Libras, Geminis, and Sagittarius because they're known for switching up on you with their emotions. Hey, hey, hey. You'd be cool. I, I was dating this girl. <coughs> she was a Sagittarius. She was my girlfriend at 2 o'clock. By 7 o'clock, I didn't know her no more. I was like, what? I called her. I was like, hey, baby, how you doing? Click. I was like, what? Hold on. Called her the next day. Hey, how you doing? I said, you hung up on me. Then she went, click. I said, oh, hold on. Hold on. I said, I dated in one girl. It's a cancer. They know for this, too. They just... Switch up on you. Turn off on you. You don't even know what happened. They just. So the point is, some people are inconsistent. It's no fun dating somebody who you don't know who you're going to be with. Y'all all right? Yeah. You okay? So God says, be consistent. Treat people how you want to be treated. Not how you feel like treating them. Because your feelings will change. They always do. I love this brother. All the time. I love this brother. All the time. Even when he do crazy stuff to me. I get mad. I, I bust at him all the time. But I still love him. <coughs> I'm not going to change my feelings and let me treat him different because I'm mad at him or because he did something. 
Treat them how you want to be treated. Treat each other how you want to be treated. And God says, if you do this, you're following all the commandments. You can go to heaven and treat people how you want to be treated, how you want to be treated. And the thing is, be nice. Be fair. Be not it's the saddest thing. Because you guys got all these mixed weird families nowadays. What that means is your mom got two or three baby dads. So what if she like, and I've seen this happen, she like your daddy more than that daddy. So if she start treating you better than this, I've seen it happen. Oh, and then he looked just like your dad. <laughs> oh, come here, Trey. You're so cute. You look like your dad. And the other kid like, really? And you can't do nothing as a kid. So that kid grows up resenting the mother and the brother. Treat everybody the same. We used to have this old thing back in the day, you got treated like a stepchild. You got treated like a foster kid. And the reason why they were saying that is because some people would treat foster children different than they would treat the other children. A foster kid don't know it's a foster kid until you say, you a foster kid because your parents are dead. <laughs> so now they're like, wow, I'm different. And see, they wouldn't know that they was a foster kid if you treat them like the other kids. So your job, treat everybody how you want to be treated. Be kind. Be fair. If you're mad, hey, I understand. That, that's life. You know, we get mad at each other, but then apologize. Don't be afraid to say I'm sorry. Men, it don't make you a punk to apologize. Men, it don't make you gay to apologize. Just say, hey, man, I messed up. And sometimes it's hard. Everybody stand. Amen. Let's give God a hand clap. That was a good Bible study. Amen. So men. A lot of things fall into your category. And the reason why God speaks to you more is because he put his power in your hand. Men make all the cars. Men build all the houses. Men do all kinds of everything that you see around you was created by men. So because of that, you have a lot of responsibility. The family is your responsibility. Whether a family turns out good or bad is based on the man. Mama, yes, yeah, she can step in there and do her the best she can. She ain't no man. You are the leaders. And because you are the leaders, Satan's going to come after you with everything. He's going to come after your woman, try to split you up. He's going to come after your kids, and you still got to be a man. Because God gave you the power to stand up to the devil. Because you were created in God's image. So that's why we started this church. It's for you young men. And we thank God for you beautiful sisters. But I'm trying to create husbands, fathers, leaders, teachers, men. See, the problem with our families now is the men don't know how to lead. There's too many men that don't know how to be leaders because they've never seen a man lead. So the best way that a man can lead, I didn't have no daddy, but I went to church every Sunday. I looked up, I saw a pastor, and I said, one day, I'm gonna be a man like him. I didn't know I was gonna be no pastor, believe me, that was not in the, in the menu. But the point is, men, it's incumbent upon you to be great leaders and examples for your own family. Amen. Anybody got any words? Yeah, the, the word sorry goes very far. Uh, I want to go see my dad today and mom them. And uh, it's like always the same old, the same old stuff. Like, I get cursed at or I just know what to expect. And speak about soft words. Um, definitely with them or without them, it's still there, but it definitely gets worse when they answer with, with wrath. Um, 
But I encourage you guys that like that have bad relationships with your fathers or just a very stale or whatever it is. I came up to my dad and I, I said sorry like many times and, and asked him for forgiveness, but I, I do it quite often because I want him to know that I'm sorry for whatever I did to him, whatever like disrespect I gave him. And I hugged him and I I said, sorry dad for not being a good son, I should have. And, and not knowing your dad or not having a bad relationship messes you up so great. And you hear from me because I've done I've done terrible things to people. There was a lack of a father figure in my life. Amen. There was a lack of my dad showing love to me. I I I I've shared to you guys. I I, I put a hand on a woman one time. I hit her. I've done things like that, and that comes out of not knowing not not knowing your dad having a bad relationship. So we gotta break these cycles because I work at a shelter, and majority are women. Single women with kids. Man, every single woman there, every single woman, they just got an abusive relationship. They beat down black and Hispanic, or most of them dominated in our, in our shelter. So, man, here, if you don't know your father, if you do or not, you need to learn to forgive. Forgive Amen. and apologize. If, you, if you've done your dad wrong, ask for forgiveness. And my dad won't forgive me, but it's fine. I'll continue to say sorry until he accepts it. So, brothers, remember, forgiveness goes far, saying sorry goes far. Amen. Because if you don't have all these situations, it will come, it will come and hit you, it will come and strike you. You'll become, you'll, you'll look in the mirror and you'll be like, I became the monster that gave that that put me in this world. I became this monster, and you'll be shocked at who you become. So forgiveness is key. And ask you, and ask you for and ask you for forgiveness. Amen. Basically, the whole Bible study was about love. And one thing that I noticed about like our generation, what would make the difference is just being accountable. If you want to be different really in this generation, just be a man of your word. Just stick to what you said you was going to do. Because I know a lot of us in here, including me, we just say things that we're going to do and we don't do it. And then it leads to a lot of disappointment because a lot of people have expectations of other people. And it ruins relationships and it ruins love. And one thing about love, like he was saying, is very inconsistent. But all God asks you to do is love him, and he, so meaning he knows that you're not going to be consistent 100% of the time. So it's really just about doing it anyway and doing what you can is just giving the effort. Amen. Tell somebody that you love them, no matter what the circumstances. Pretty much Amen. So, last couple of we we are here. Um, it's this is crazy, and this is human nature, but it's sad. Abused people often turn into abusers. Think about that. You went through something negative, and then you turn around, you do the same thing as somebody else. Somebody hurts you, and then you turn around and do the same hurt to somebody else. That is that is a demon that we have to break. So if something happens in your life, when you get children or you get become a boy, whatever it is, you get like, we don't do the same thing. I never understood why people who were molested would turn around and molest somebody else. But that those are the ones. And you're like, man, that same thing happened to you. So, all right, everybody bow your heads. Thank you, dear Heavenly Father. We thank you for this evening. We thank you for the word that went forth. As you continue to bless these young people, Father, help them, Father, to know you more, get closer and closer to them, Father. Draw them near to your word, draw, Father. Help them to obey, Father, and do those things that you called them to do. Squeeze the hand next to you. I squeeze life into the hand. I squeeze prosperity into the hand. I squeeze purpose, vision, and purpose into the hand, Father, that these young people become leaders. Father, that they do everything that you called them to do, that no weapon formed against them shall prosper, that all their dreams come true, Father, that they have faith and that they have confidence and that they have high self-esteem to know that you created them for a special purpose. Where's that Jesus saying? Amen. Give somebody a hand clap.